The latest headlines from BBC News, I'm Gavin Gray. A special advisor to Gambia's new president, Adam Barrow, has said that more than $11 million are thought to be missing from the state's coffers following the departure of longtime ruler Yahya Jama. The White House says it's in the initial stages of discussions about moving the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. President Donald Trump and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu discussed by phone on Sunday the Palestinian peace process and Iran. And the mobile phone giant Samsung has said that faulty batteries and problems in the manufacturing process are behind some of its phones overheating and bursting into flames. The Galaxy Note 7 phone was permanently dropped in October last year after a number of handsets malfunctioned and in some cases burst into flames. Now it's time for Dateline London. Hello and welcome to Dateline London. Two stories dominate the week and are likely to dominate the year ahead too. The beginnings of the Trump presidency and the beginning of the end for Britain in the European Union. My guests today are John Fisher Burns of the New York Times, Thomas Keelinger of Die Welt, Polly Toynbee of The Guardian and Dmitry Shishkin of BBC World Service. Well, Donald Trump first. And as he begins the job of being 45th president of the United States, to paraphrase a question from the presidential debates, let's start by saying something nice, positive and hopeful about the new president. I know this is going to be a stretch for you, but have a go. After that inaugural speech in which he reached out to nobody at all, in which he trashed all of the previous presidents sitting around him very politely, I think the only thing that we can seriously hope for is that this megalomaniac, this sociopath, will overreach himself to such a degree that he will be impeached, he will do something so monstrous that he'll be impeached as soon as possible, hopefully before that four years is up, uh, and that he will simply be removed. Uh, he is utterly unfit to be President of the United States, and I think we saw that writ large in his speech, which was the most outrageously ungracious speech I think probably any president has ever made at an inauguration. John, I challenge you to do a bit better than that. It's <laughs> uh, just a possibility <laughs> here. Um, well, there was very little uh, for anybody who is not an American um, in that speech. Uh, there was very little for the people who have felt that uh, American presidencies in the last 30 or 40 years have achieved uh, significant things. But I think if we look at what he is promising for America, um, uh, rebuilding the infrastructure of America, uh, bringing jobs back to America, these are going to be difficult things to do. It's not at all clear where in the case of inf the infrastructure he's going to find the money. But anybody who has traveled through America, particularly anybody who's traveled through uh, the Ohio Valley, uh, will know that an, an attempt, a serious attempt to bring jobs back to rebuild American industries is long overdue. And therefore, to sum that up in a slogan, put America, America first, I mean, I know there's another context from the 1930s, but to say in the 21st century, I'm going to put America first, that absolutely strikes home, doesn't it? It does. It has, it has of course, uh, some pretty ominous uh, overtones for anybody who knows American history, including American history in the 20th century. It was Charles Lindbergh uh, and it was uh, isolationism and protectionism then. Mm. You know, uh, the adjectives that have been rolled out in the press here, indeed in much of the world in the last few days, for the last few months about Trump, uh, are thes thesaurus of denigration. And it's hard to disagree on the basis of what we saw in the campaign with very much of it. Uh, but on the other hand, 63 million people, it may be that 65 or 66 million people voted for Hillary Clinton, but 63 million people themselves, and many of them far from being crass, vulgar uh, bullies, uh, they found something in Trump that persuaded them that he would change the course of America to their benefit. And I think it's far too soon to conclude that they were wrong. And Thomas, uh, you know, you've covered, you've been based in Washington, seen mm. many presidential inaugurals. Uh, the first inaugural of Ronald Reagan was greeted in Britain and in Europe with a, a 
perhaps not the same amount of dismay, but there were quite a lot of headlines saying, you know, he's just an actor, which was completely not true because he'd had eight years as governor of California. And what was worse, this perception uh, continued throughout his entire years. In Europe, you could never get a sensible set of opinion to understand that America is different from our way of doing politics, and that Reagan is, after all, comes straight from the bone marrow of American identity, and he was to be a great president. Nobody recognized that, really, until today. Mm -hmm. There's not a single street in Germany that uh, says Reagan Street or Reagan Plaza, although he was the guy in 87 who said, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. But you have lots of Kennedy statues and so forth. No, but I must say, to come back to um, um, Polly's characterization, I totally agree with the nature of his speech. But that in, in itself leads me to a positive conclusion that he will unite not Americans so much, because he didn't do much to do that in his speech, but he will unite Europe. NATO will, will begin to understand that something needs to be done to do better than they have so far. It will also cause minds to pause in, in the Brexit debate. I don't think EU and Britain can afford to go down the route into sort of trade wars. We're going to have to watch our trade relations with America. So that might lead to a unifying sort of element amongst <laughs> Europeans and, 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 and in relation to Britain. So it'll have a positive effect on the Brexit debate, I'm sure. Right. Well, and Dimitri, I've kept you to last because, uh, uh, you know, President Putin is hoping to talk to Mr. Trump sometime quite soon, and I take it the Russian response has been, insofar as we can read it, pretty positive. So, um, in the BBC interview, Dmitry Peskov, the press secretary of, uh, of Putin yesterday, said that they would um, go and celebrate the Russian Christian holiday of Epiphany yesterday, rather than watch the, uh, the inaugural address. However, what we know that the potentially Reykjavik summit, echoing 1986 between Reagan and Gorbachev, might be happening between Trump and Putin quite soon. That's one. If you ask me to say something positive about Putin as a BBC employee, I can't do either. But what I can say is that what Russian television has been saying about, about Trump and the positive thing is that they call him the man of his word. Uh, and that's interesting it's in itself. Uh, politicians generally say that they don't know what is going to happen, really, because there is nothing to say anything concrete about, uh, about his policies moving forward. But what they definitely are saying, that the, because the tide is changing, they think that actually I'm making... Uh, Trump think about America only is actually good for Russia because a it means that uh, Russia can go and again start um, asserting its influence on the former Soviet republics in the area and actually if you look at the wish list in Russian wish list to President Trump is actually not going to be quite dissimilar to Trump's po possible agenda maybe apart from uh, Middle East where Syria is one thing, but actually long-term Middle East um, strategy for Russia and America are quite different. Mr. Peskov has also said that you can't, effectively, there can't be real progress in Syria without the Americans. So, in other words, well, the possibility of some it, kind of it, deal it, pre with a deal pre Precisely, but I, I, I guess um, uh, this is exactly right about NATO, but I think even if America withdraws itself from um, different types of bodies, from World Bank, IMF, UN, uh, this is all actually quite... Uh, positive will be seen quite positive in I Moscow. I thought that one of the first casualties of Trump's uh, vision for America is his hope for improved relationships with Russia and mm. Putin. And the fact that he's appointed, for example, as Secretary of Defense, and he's not alone amongst the cabinet nominees, somebody who takes a much tougher line on Russia General is Mattis. pretty indicative and that uh, it won't be very long before Mr. That, Trump that, and Mr. That, that Putin fall out. You, you, are, you are right, and that's why I think the, uh, to, the, the um, current uh, feeling in Moscow is the feeling of let's wait and see what will happen because actually mm -hmm. I wouldn't my, I wouldn't actually be surprised by by hearing on the Russian television moving forward that Trump himself is our guy he's good he really means well but he's surrounded by the establishment and the hawks of Washington doesn't won't allow him. Well, sir, I think that what we see is two ex rather similar and perhaps quite impulsive characters. I think the idea that they're going to somehow make great fr a great friendship it'll take very little. There is kind of tinder. Box. Yeah. It'll take very little for either of them to take great offence at something the other one does. The possibility of, of friction seems to me much greater than the idea oh, of this. Great, unless, of course, unless, of course, it is true he's totally in Putin's hands and that he has blackmail material and all of that. But leaving that aside. I, I, I would agree. And I also would say that actually they are both people of uh, their masters of photo opportunities. And actually for Putin to be seen uh, alone with Trump uh, in this kind of Russia-US really important summit is a really important thing. 
nothing. But it, the, interesting, this choreography. I mean, if there's a Reykjavik summit, mm. Reykjavik summit at the time was hailed as a disaster because it yeah. didn't, didn't go anywhere. And then people within the Reagan administration said the president tried to give away all nuclear weapons. Mm. Goodness me. And then afterwards, people thought, what was so wrong about that? Was, is this yeah. possible to, to dream that kind of thing? It, it's funny. The dream conti continues, and I'm sure quite rightly. But the way Reagan went about it uh, without consulting with his allies was totally uh, uh, negative. Mind you, Reagan started, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, with that very famous statement in his first press conference the day after he was inaugurated when Sam Donaldson from ABC asked him, Mr. President, what do you think about the Soviet Union? He said, they lie, they cheat, and they want to conquer the world. So for, for Trump to give... Um, Putin, so much for the benefit of the doubt, already saying you can trust him when, when Russia has to re-earn its trust after all that happened recently with the, with the, the Olympic Games drug uh, scandals and, uh, and, 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 and interfering in American debate. Mm -hmm. So to come out with this statement, you want to trust uh, Putin. He says, See, I trust Putin as much as I trust Angela Merkel, which is a juxtaposition of outrageous proportion. Which didn't go down very well in Germany. It didn't go down very well in Germany. I, in terms of in terms of what you think he you know what he might do if he does spend a lot of money somehow domestically in rebuilding infrastructure which just about anybody thinks needs to be rebuilt and you did make the caveat how is he going to do it where is the money going to come from but also he's got to persuade congress and isn't one of the big it may not be as obvious as foreign policy to people sitting in Europe and around the world, but he has got to deal with people in Congress who are in the Republican Party, who have the levers of power, some of whom don't like him. Now, the question is, do, will they be close to him because he's the president and they have to be seen to be, or will they look at the next election, which is in two years, as far as they're concerned, and say, mm, not sure? Well, when I, the many years I spent in China, the Chinese government spokesman had a favourite, um, iteration when asked a question they didn't want to answer and that was situation remains to be determined <laughs> and this certainly are so many uncertainties that we cannot know but it seems to me one uh, plain point of friction is going to be money uh, on the one hand Trump has talked about doing something about this gigantic uh, multi-trillion dollar deficit mm. uh, on the other hand he wants to build up the armed forces on which the United States is already spending the best part of $700 billion a year. Now he wants to rebuild American uh, influence. Where's the money going to come from? And it has to come via Congress. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and Congress, we know Republicans are very, very loath to spend money. I think it's, I think it's going to be a lot of conflict there. I think it's, it, it's interesting how little he was scrutinized. Mm -hmm. And what's been extraordinary about this election is that any normal election, a presidential candidate would have to answer that question. You're going to cut taxes, you're going to spend hugely on armed forces, huge amount of help on the infrastructure, you're going to save working class Rust Belt America. Uh, where are the tax cuts coming? Well, the tax cuts are all, of course, for the rich, not for the poor. How does he square any of that? Nobody ever got to him to One force thing, him to answer those. talk about the similarities, uh, and I think there are more dissimilarities between Trump uh, and Reagan, but one obvious dissimilarity is that Reagan was an em emollient individual. He was a charming individual. Uh, even his political opponents found him a likable individual. It seems to me that's not the case with Trump. And in terms of his relationships with Congress, that may prove to be um, an, another difficulty. Could I, could I suggest to you one, one thing that, one really strong positive, which you may dislike, is that he is a great communicator. Now, people will parse the language and will look at the speech and so on, but to the people he needs to con contact or, or communicate with, the use of Twitter, which isn't scrutinized, it's just a thing that's said and then is republished. That's one of the reasons why he wasn't scrutinized in the way that you suggest during the election, because he was able to say in 140 characters, make America great again, and people thought that's a great idea. Yep, the, the Twitter's been brilliant, and he's plainly going to go on with it right through the all day and all night, tweeting away. Uh, and it does mean that he doesn't get uh, challenged or questioned, he just puts it out there to his own followers, and that works very well. And I think that's a, a, a frightening lesson for modern and politicians. Who could, who could doubt listening to that rather dull speech, inaugural speech yesterday, that it was indeed written by nobody other than Donald Trump? He also said he was going to eradicate Islamic terror. Mm. Now, they're, 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 well, 
you know, that's going to be a difficult job, eradication of Islamic terror. But setting a tone, that is something that he could clearly work with Moscow on. Well, clearly, because we, as you remember, the relationship between um, Russia, Soviet Union and the West always were, uh, they actually were quite constructive on anything to do with the nuclear missile treaties, right? Irrespective of how bad the relationship were between, say, Brezhnev and Reagan in early 80s, they still were able to go and do something on, on the missiles. Or in terms of the um, uh, cooperation in between the secret services then definitely post 9-11 when Putin was the first to call Bush and he was actually quite proud of that that he has suggested his help and everything so this will this definitely will continue but um, let's just not name, make any mistakes about why um, what what aims are Putin is trying to achieve in the Middle East or anywhere else and others because obviously as I was referring to the wish list wish list actually goes much f uh, further than that there is a question about Ukraine and Georgia not ever joining uh, NATO but again we probably were already in that situation where people, there is this urban legend and nobody quite knows whether it is true or not, whether Gorbachev was promised that not a single country in Europe would ever join NATO after the reunification of Germany. Not a lot of people actually, well, there is a mixed kind of uh, stories about whether this actually happened. So I think here it's uh, the same thing. I think I agree with you. If they hit it off, it will be really fabulous relationship between them two for the next whatever years uh, Trump might have. But um, it's hard. The it difference is that Putin has a plan, and I don't think Trump has a plan at all. Trump has tweets. Trump has uh, an emotive. I don't think he knows where George is. But in a, 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 a post-truth. Quite tired phrase now already, but in the in the world where people uh, believe in with their hearts and we react with their hearts rather than their minds, we're talking about scrutiny. Uh, we as journalists are interested in that sort of thing, but I, I guess societies in large around the world probably are going towards the fact. But, but, and the, the, there are some other obvious uh, problems. For instance, Iran hmm. is. Well, in a, a de facto ally in the Middle East with Russia, and Iran is one of the bogeymen that Donald Trump has, has uh, threatened so, to so uh, that change is, that is relations with. That is definitely one of the questions. They are not going to be comfortable talking about. That's one thing. Uh, I also would say that in the Middle East, if uh, America obviously sides with uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia clearly with Iran, so that that's the biggest, uh, the, big, the, the, the biggest the, issue. You know what's said and done with relations with the rest of the world. The most important relationship is the White House relationship with Congress. No, no wonder we call Congress the other arm of government. And that is essential. He can't do anything unless he uh, strikes an emollient or, or intolerant relationship with Congress. Um, uh, Carter was a case in point. Carter had majority of his own party in Congress in his four years, but he was constantly bogged down by, by fighting his own people up in Congress. He couldn't make headways in international relations because he couldn't make peace with Congress. So he is, it's essential that Congress and, 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 and Trump will get on. And I'm not sure that they will because the, the t t Twitter, Twitter uh, misculture, or whatever you call it, is, is a terrible um, uh, um, habit of his, juvenile habit, to be pursuing. And, and, and I wish he'd become a tweetotaler. He, I know he's, a, he's a teetotaler. We but know it that. communicates with people who w will not listen to White House speeches, will not uh, uh, as well. It communicates with a lot of people and that's one of the reasons he's been he so doesn't, yeah. He doesn't read him anything himself. He says, I don't read, I haven't got time. Uh, yeah. All he could read is tweets and he assumes that all his followers yeah. read tweets. And he overpromises though. And that speech yesterday was full of overpromising and he raises expectations in the wild sort of fashion which Congress will very soon, uh, so, uh, soon shut down, I'm sure. And then there's, there's, we should remember how Macmillan's dictum about events, dear boy, events. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can imagine any number of events, and there are some events that may be, may be forthcoming, may be unimaginable. Indeed, the events of 2016 were an unimaginable a year ago, mm. um, which could knock, for example, uh, in Trump's ambition to establish closer relationships with Putin uh, aside. What if there's friction, for example, along the borders of the Russia and Estonia, Russia and Lithuania? Mm. How long would that uh, well, take? We don't, we don't know that. If he is so uh, convinced that he needs to concentrate on Rusty Belt and building all the factories and whatever, then, you know, he, 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 he said that America first and potentially, you know, mm. Estonia Estonia coming at the end of the queue, because I want to come on to queues about trade yeah. and other things, because Theresa May made clear her plans for Brexit this week, or she didn't. Britain out of the single market certainly was clear enough, but if we don't get a deal, she said, Britain is prepared to walk away. So what, 
might that mean and how is Mrs May's clarity or otherwise viewed around the world? I mean, first of all, in, in, uh, we'll get to the trade talks with, mm. you know, head of the queue, back, back of the queue, right. whatever. But in Germany, when uh, people heard uh, what Mrs May had to say, was it much clearer what Britain is aiming for? Well, it's, it's very hard for Germans to understand the way the British mind ticks. They're still, to this day, they un don't understand how a nation, a member of the EU, can even conceive of leaving it. This notion of the island uh, nation going for the global sort of uh, horizon is totally a strange um, way of thinking. We're in the middle of Europe, surrounded by nothing but friends at the moment, thank goodness, and we need to be collectively involved. And for Britain to go it alone, of course, they, they, they struggle to understand it. I keep reminding them that Shakespeare's first theatre was called The Globe. So there is a, tendency, a, a tradition in, in, in English thinking, like seafaring nations reach out beyond the immediate continent in their neighbourhood. And other than that, though, they, they, they think they will look at it rationally. And the arrival of Trump on the scene, as I said before, gives me hope. The two sides, the EU and, and Britain, will come together at a working, workable sort of solution. There's no uh, um, advantage to be gained from going into a trade war sort of uh, mindset uh, between uh, the EU and Great Britain. Uh, and while, while you have to be careful not to make it too easy for Britain to leave it, because that would uh, uh, bring up copycat mentalities in other European nations, you might say, OK, we can also leave it and get... So that's, that, that, that's, that's probably is a, again, unofficial hope in the, uh, mm. in, from within Kremlin, is that's basically starting an avalanche for the same yeah. Um, this, the same trends in other countries. Well, Gerd Wilders, uh, Marine Le Pen, well, uh, yes. Alternative for Deutschland, other, other yeah. countries yeah. But have also, their own. So you know that actually relationship movements. between European and Union and European Union and Russia were always subject to this excess of South and North. Um, southern countries were more pro-Russian. Northern countries are, and I'm gener generalizing here, but you, you definitely have Greece and some former central of so, former countries from the Eastern Bloc. But block. now you have Le Pen part finance. Yes, part well, uh, yes, that's another thing. But I, uh, I also think that uh, if you look at it, probably the Britain leaving the European Union is out of the public debate in uh, in Russia it's just not an issue it's just not, irrelevant well, it's completely to... irrelevant and mm. I think well just regular Russians probably would say well I wish we had your problems just generally that would be one <laughs> one, one way of looking at it and other people would say well um, good for you we all know how bad European Union is and just go and do it alone because you're a great country and just do you do think we got clarity this week no absolutely not um, we got we, we got some fairly ill intent in the idea that she would say, yes, we're going to be leaving the single market. Yes, we're going to be leaving the customs union. But somehow we're going to have some magical deal, which is just as good as being inside. When or the response right across Europe, whether it was in Brussels or in individual capitals, was you can't do that. You're either in or you're out. There is no way in which you're going to have a better deal. You will not have to pay in. You will not have to accept free freedom of movement. And then, of course, this global fantasy. It was, a, it was extraordinary sort of empire talk. She has an Elizabeth I fantasy, apparently. She sees herself in this world. We will travel the world in our little ships and have these wonderful trade deals. If we want a trade deal with India, for instance, they will demand a lot more visas. Now, a lot of the impetus against mm -hmm. Europe was also an anti-Asian, an anti anti-Islamic feeling about immigration, as much as it was anti-Poles or Hungarians. I don't think people are going to tolerate the idea that we have to have oh, a whole lot more people from India in order to have a, an Indian deal. The idea we're going to have a good deal with, with Trump Trump will make a deal. I, Reddy's, I, I interviewed him in 1988. Reddy's appalling book, The Art of the Deal. He always comes out on top. The other guy is always screwed. That's the way you do it. Any kind of deal between us and America means we have to accept their hormone and antibiotic infused meat. We have to accept their regulations, not EU regulations. The moment we do that, of course, then we cut ourselves off even more from Europe because we're not accepting European you know, regulations. I've, I've said this on this program before. I think a lot of the discussion about Brexit and where it's going to carry us um, is conducted as if we live in a rather static kind of world and Europe right now is not in a static condition. We know that forthcoming elections in France, indeed in Germany and in Italy,
uh, can radically change the Europe that Mrs. May is going to be negotiating Not to with. mention the Italian and banking system and many other economic I factors. I wouldn't be at all surprised predict. within the precincts of 10 Downing Street is if Mrs. May is actually quite pleased at the possibility <coughs> of delay in uh, invoking Article 50 because if the further she can push these negotiations uh, into the era of the emerging Europe, the Europe where there could be, for example, a referendum in uh, Europe and in, uh, in, in Italy and in France, which could very easily go the same way as ours did. And I think we might... Uh, a year from not now, going to be delayed. You, you hear, you hear Labour, most of Labour people, a few rebels, uh, Corbyn saying, we're going to sign it. Uh, the Lib Dems won't, but uh, she'll get it through, I'm afraid. On a point of clarity, um, uh, Polly, I, I, with due respect, I, I, was, I felt it was clear in one aspect. She is willing to go for brinkmanship with Europe. She has a way of taking each other's sides to ransom as well. If you don't agree with me, we have another way of becoming a different country. But that's a reasonable uh, negotiating tactic. It's a reason it? all right. Except it's such a terrible prospect. She wants us to be uh, Singapore. She wants us to be, uh, you know, a, a, a bargain basement lowest possible mm. tax we would she be cutting off our own yeah. nose to spite our face if we did that yeah uh, well, go ahead uh, no, no, it's, it's, sorry. I, I agree and 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 the uh, and the impossibility of her suggestion of course strikes you immediately because there are so many <laughs> squares to circles to square as it were one thing is uh, where is the money we talked about money in in, in, in the trump case uh, where, where does she get the money to do all the social well, reforms that she's promised and just but, so, you know, uh, if we, I, yeah, I, I think that the UK goes into these negotiations with quite a few advantages uh, to cite only one. Uh, how many BMWs are sold in this mm. country every year? 265,000, I think. Uh, so where is German industry, the motor industry, going to be on this issue? They certainly don't want to drive the UK into some sort of a high tariff isolation. Mm. So I ransom that I mentioned, that you're holding all, all Europe to ransom just, just on, the, on that account. Well, yeah. but this I mean, is a very important point because the Germans and the rest of Europe, like us, are less motivated by economics when it comes to the crunch than by principle. And their principles about Europe will be stronger, just as ours were. We, you know, we've done ourselves terribly economic harm for the sake of a fantasy belief in our great independence. Have we done ourselves true? Well, we don't know. We don't harm? know. But it, mean, it's quite likely. So far, all the prognostications have bloomed. We, we haven't have... done anything yet. We're not but, out. We haven't no, even but signed mar the markets, article yet. Markets are all predictive. And the markets seem to have been decided that this is a doable thing. I guess for, uh, from somebody who came to this country about 16 six years ago, I can say that I can feel it actually internationally, globally. Britain as the country where English is spoken, part of Europe, will still be extremely, extremely interesting for people from Asia to come and do business with, from uh, South Asia, East Asia, Russia. Um, all other countries, uh, Africa as well. I think. I think it just there is something culturally and there is something existentially that Britain will remain a very big magnet for. Okay. And a very large part of that is our relationship with the United States and the mm. fact that we have a common language and, to some considerable extent, a Island common culture. surrounded by waves. We'll uh, from have to leave it there. That's it for Dateline London for this week. You can comment on the program on Twitter at Gavin Esther and engage with our guests. We're back next week at the same time. Please make a date with Dateline London. Bye bye.